Uh, hello, welcome to my uh, video video diary. <laughs> um, today I'm wearing a sweet sleeveless shirt. Um, so last time uh, I talked about uh, Bridget Pagin Kelly and her some of her the themes and poems from Poem Song in the Orchard. And today um, I've been thinking a lot about that. And today I wanted to go and um, uh, kind of go through a specific poem and look at that what that poem's doing. Not really an explanation of the poem, but just kind of um, you know pointing out some of the images and themes that I think are interesting. Um, so the poem is "Blessed is the Field" and it's from uh, the Orchard. So if you want to, if you have a copy of the book or um, you know you want to go find the poem, that's what it is. Um, so, blessed is the field. I'm going to go ahead and read the poem aloud, and uh, that way, if you have a copy, you can follow, or if not, you know, here you go, and then kind of go through it. Um, a few images, you know, I'm not going to spend, you know, 30 minutes going through the whole poem, even though I think the poem could, could, you could do that with this poem, right? Um, so, blessed is the field. In the late heat, the snake root and goldenrod run high, white and gold the steaming flowers, green and gold, the acid-bitten leaves. It is good to say first an invocation, though the words do not always seem to work. Still one must try. Bow your head, cross your arms, say, Blessed is the day, and the one who destroys the day. Blessed is this ring of fire in which we live. How bitter the burning leaves, how bitter and sweet, how bitter and sweet the sound of the single gold and black insect repeating its lonely, its two lonely notes. The insect's song both magnifies the field and casts a shadow over it, the way a doorbell ringing through an abandoned house makes the failing rooms, falling rooms papered with lilies and roses and two-headed goats seem larger and more ghostly. The high grass spill their seed. It is hard to know the right way in or out, but here, you can have which flowers you like, though there are not many left. Lady's thumb in the gravel by the wood's fringe, and on the shale spit beneath the black walnut that houses the crow, the peculiar cat's paw, sweet everlasting, unbearably soft. Do not mind the crow's bark, he is fierce and solitary, but he will not but he will let us pass, patron of the lost and broken spirited. Behind him in the quarter ring of sumacs, flagged like circus tents, the deer I follow, and that even now are watching us, sleep at night their restless sleep. I find their droppings in the morning, and here at my feet is the self-heal, humblest of all flowers, bloomless but still intact. I ate some whole once and did not get well, but it may strike your fancy. The smell of burning rubber is from a rabbit carcass that dog, that, um, sorry, a rabbit carcass the dog dragged into the ravine, and the smell of lemons is a snake root I am crushing between my thumb and forefinger. There could be beneath this field an underground river full of sweet liquid. A dowser might find it with his witching wand and his prayers. Some prayers can move even the stubborn dirt. Do you hear? The bird I have never seen is back. Each day at this time, he takes up his ominous clucking fretting like a baby lonely sweetling it is hard to know the right way in or out but look the golden rod is the color of beaten skin say blessed are those who stand still in their confusion blessed is the field as it burns um so i messed up once or twice but you know whatever so um the title of the poem is blessed is the field and we begin um in the late heat the snake root and golden rod run high and I just want to kind of look at the, the names of the plants that are kind of um, brought up um, throughout this poem. We have the first two, snake root and goldenrod. You know, already these very evocative um, names, right? Um, and so many plants um, traditionally have these, like, really interesting and evocative names. Um, and plants have often been symbols within poetry, right? There's a whole thing about flowers during the... the the, the Middle Ages, right? Um, and, I mean, flowers have often been used, I mean, still used, right? Um, what is a rose a symbol for? Well, that's easy, love, right? Um, uh, though often mixed, right? Uh, love but with thorns, right? 
Um, but here we have snake root and goldenrod. So, so goldenrod, you know, um, the names are kind of self-explanatory. What is goldenrod? Well, it's a, it looks like a goldenrod, right? But then this kind of um, symbolic um, of, 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 of kingliness, right? Or, or uh, some kind of staff, right? Or if, if you want to even go um, uh, uh, like more Freudian with it, like what is a staff and ultimately a symbol of, right? Um, it's a phallic symbol. Um, and then snake root, right? Um, the root that snakes its way in, right? And what, I mean, all roots kind of snake um, uh, their way through the, the ground, right? But this one is, is specifically snake root, right? So it's kind of like goldenrod, which could be thought of as this kingly, right? And snake root thought of this kind of lowly. So it's a mixture of the low and the high, right? Um, and then uh, the next... Um, we get white and gold, the steaming flowers, green and gold, the acid bitten leaves. So in the first um, stanza, we're given this kind of mixture of low and high, but also of, of this kind of beauty, right? This kind of field full of these um, wildflowers and plants and grasses, but also acid bitten leaves, right? Um, some, something is not quite right here, or something is, is, is slightly ominous. And that's common with Bridget Pegin's, Pegin Kelly's work, where she mixes these beautiful images with these more ominous or, or something deadly, right, lying right underneath. Also with the name snake root, right, uh, something deadly right underneath the ground, right. Um, uh, so, and then we get to the invocation. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, we get the burning leaves, how bitter the burning leaves, bitter and sweet. And we, I think we all can have that bitter and sweet. Once again, these two kind of opposites put together, but we all kind of can attach. Um, I say we all, but most of us can attach memories to, to leaf burning, right? Um, it being both bitter and sweet and, and both like literally the smell of it being bitter and sweet, but also the feeling of it being bitter and sweet, right? Leaves are beautiful, but then they die and have to fall to the ground. And it's like fun to jump in them, right? Or to play in them. Um, but it's also like you're burning leaf bodies, right? Um, in, in the end. So there's that double, double invocation there. Um, and then the next kind of plant names we get are ladies' thumbs, ladies' thumbs and the gravel by the woods fringe. And so, like literally, if if we're just reading that, not even as a plant, we're we're thinking of people's thumbs just kind of sitting in gravel, um, like something out of a horror movie, like something out of like, um, you know, I, I'm thinking of like mid mid midsummer where the the person's like leg is planted in the ground or. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, the original, um, the um, wicker man, sorry, the original wicker man where the, they got the hand and it's got the candle wicks in it. And I don't know, it's just some, it's something like that, right? But it's, it's the name of a, a plant, but it works both ways, both as the name of a plant, like sticking out of the gravel, innocent, but also as this invocation of ladies' thumbs sticking out of the gravel. Um, so like, what does that mean, right? How are these kind of two things being brought together? Um, uh, and on the shale spit beneath the black walnut that houses the crow, so the crow which is brought up and will be brought back up, the peculiar cat's paw, sweet everlasting, unbearably soft, right? So this this invocation of a, like a literal cat's paw, which is unbearably soft, right? But if you want to touch a cat's paw, normally the cat is going to probably scratch you. Um, they don't typically like to have their the, the, their paws kind of messed with. Um, but sweet, everlasting, unbearably soft, right? Unbearable softness, right? It's so soft that we can't take it, right? Once again, these kind of two opposites brought together, um, paradoxically. Um, and then do not mind the crow's bark. I love that, um, though that's not quite a... a, a plant image right but it is kind of a mixed metaphor right the crow is somehow a dog and it's barking but also the crow is up in a tree and trees have bark right and so there's like these multiple kind of images thrown together like the lady's thumb right like the plant or the cat's paw right these words have multiple meanings and they have um they're almost puns but they're um they're not 
they're they're more deadly than puns, right? They're 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 more scary than puns. Um, and then a quarter ring of sumacs, uh, flagged like circus tents, right? Which is kind of the levity of it. But then a quarter ring of these things, like almost like a half moon of sumacs, which is um, there's a lot of mixed imagery in this poem. We're not going to quite talk about that right now. Maybe I'll make another video or I go into that. But um, we have uh, uh, this kind of pagan imagery um, mixed with Christian imagery, right? Um, kind of embodying both at the same time. Once again, we have these two kind of things that are um, perhaps opposites, but they're coming together um, paradoxically. Um, but maybe we'll talk about that in another video. <laughs> I'm just going to make 40 videos about this one poem. Um, and then here at my feet is the self heal, humblest of flowers, bloomless, but still intact. So the self heal, right? Uh, once again, what is this thing, right? What is this below us? The self heal, uh, a, a flower, humblest of all flowers, you know, the humblest, it has no bloom, but it's still here. It's still a flower. It's still intact. But then I ate some whole once it did not get well, but it may strike your fancy, right? This self heal, this, the, the narrator ate some. Uh, the speaker of the poem, and it didn't help her, but maybe it'll help you, right? Um, and this is this is uh, uh, where the poem kind of moves out of uh, just the I talking about being in this this field and talking directly to the reader, or um, or um, to some kind of witness, right? Um, and then the smell of lemon is the snake root I'm crushing between my thumb and forefinger. Um, and I, I want to, uh, well, we'll end on the goldenrod, but um, the thumb and forefinger, right? You can, you can imagine the snake root being kind of rubbed between those two. Um, and the smell, right, is of lemon, right? Um, which is a, a really interesting smell. Um, uh, sour, but kind of comforting at the same time, or sour, but kind of nice. Um, and then also like thumb and forefinger, um, is not directly, but anytime you're kind of thumb and finger, right? You're kind of looking back to Seamus Haney's, Haney's Digging, which is a poem about um, about the land, but also about writing poetry. And this poem is kind of about both of those things at once, so a, a much different poem. Um, and then finally, the last image we'll look at is the image of the goldenrod, which returns. But look, the goldenrod is the color of beaten skin, say, Blessed are those who stand still in their confusion. Blessed is the field as it burns. And once again, we're brought into this kind of paradox. Um, blessed is the field as it burns. Blessed is the thing as it's being destroyed. But the golden rod, which is the color of bruised skin, bruised by a rod, right? Perhaps uh, the kingliness is punishing um, something. So maybe this king is not quite um, a good king, right? Maybe no king is a good king, right? Or just an invocation of the color of the flowers, right? Or a color of the goldenrod. We're looking out at a field and this is the color of it. And it's both of those things at once. Um, and uh, once again, this imagery is mixing um, the real and the symbolic in a way that is, they're almost inextricable from each other um, in a really unique way. Um, so that doesn't really explain the poem, right? <laughs> But it, it does give some insight into uh, like what some of the imagery in this poem is doing, right? And there's a whole uh, other set of imagery within the poem um, where it's where it's you know where we haven't talked really about the 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 religious imagery other, um, other than where it overlaps with the the imagery um, of flowers and plants, but um, that's there also, right? And so this poem is doing a lot of complex things, and it's not a super long poem. And I think that's one thing that um, kind of illustrates Bridget Pegeen Kelly's Bridget Pegeen Kelly's um, genius, right? Her her ability to mix these things to make this um, field seem at once real and symbolic, to exist in in the real and in the dream at the same time, right? And it's something that is almost unbearable, right? This unbearable softness, right? Um, it's 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 um, it's a very strange, wonderful, scary, beautiful poem, um, and I hope that you uh, got something from our little chat about it today. <laughs>